I want to talk to you today on how to receive a return on failure. And yes, you heard me right. How to receive a return on failure. It's highly probable that you've never heard anybody talk on that subject. I can promise you, until I developed this teaching myself, I never heard anybody talk about getting a return on failure. I've heard people talk about getting an ROI, a return on investment. I've heard people talk about an ROT, a return on time. But a return on failure? How interesting this is, especially in a culture and a climate that basically um, we fear failure and we don't want to be a part of failure. We don't want to be associated with failure. But I will promise you that if you'll stay with me in this lesson, there is much to learn. There is much to apply so that you can really receive a return on your failure. So first of all, let's just talk about it. First, nobody likes failure. I, at least when I say nobody likes failure, I've never met anybody that liked failure. I've never run into a person and I've asked them, how's your day going? And have them say, oh my gosh, I've had an incredible day. I I have failed three times today and I, I just get such energy out of my losses and my misses and my hurts and my mistakes. Oh, I've never heard anybody talk about it. Have you? Really? Really? You see, I, I have come to the con conclusion that everybody fails, but no one likes it. And that's why I think this subject is so important. I don't like failure. I don't think you do either. And yet, it's such a part of our lives. When I was a young leader in my 30s in America, uh, I was I was finding out that there were some things that, that, that there were some risk I wasn't taking. That as a young entrepreneur, there are times when I just didn't step out, and and the reason was I didn't want to fail because I was young, and I thought if I fail, people will look at me and they'll say, "Well, you know, he's a young leader; he's not he's not very good." And so failure. And the fear of failure had, had a little bit of grip on me, and it had a tendency to hold me back. But I had a wonderful mentor named Robert Schuler, and he came into my life in my early 30s, and we talked about this and, and over dinner one night, and he said to me, John, I'm going to give you a question to ask yourself, and if you'll ask yourself this question, I think you'll do more attempts in, in, in your projects. And I said, well, great. What's the question? And the question he gave me was a simple one. And here it is. He said, John, what would you attempt? What would you attempt to do if you knew you wouldn't fail? And when he asked me that question, what would I attempt to do if I knew I wouldn't fail? Honestly, I, I thought, well, there's a lot of things I would attempt to do if I knew that I wasn't going to fail. And so I started using that question as a young leader, and it really helped me for about a year, just start new things, try new things. And every time I get to it, I said, well, you know, what would I attempt if I knew I wouldn't fail? And well, I'm going to attempt this. And, and I jumped into the project. Now, it really wasn't a good question. When he asked me to ask myself the question, what would you attempt to do if you knew you wouldn't fail, it's a bad question because it's not a question of reality. There's no such project that you can go into that you can say to yourself with integrity, I know I won't fail. Really? I've never had any kind of new endeavor that kind of excluded failure as a possibility. So it wasn't a good question because it wasn't a truthful question. It wasn't a realistic question. And so I would jump in with eagerness. Well, what would I attempt to do if I knew I wouldn't fail, only to jump in and fail? And then I thought, now, hey, now what would I do? So today I'm going to give you another question. This is a good question. I have encouraged people to ask this question thousands of times, and I encourage you to do it now. And here it is. What would you attempt to do if you knew that failure could give you a positive return? In other words, you're getting ready to start a new project. What would you attempt to do in starting that project if you knew that when you failed, 
it would have a positive return in your life. Not, not if you fail, because you will fail. I fail, you fail, we all fail. And we, truthfully, we fail continually. So the question, what would you attempt to do if you knew that when you failed, you would get, instead of a negative return out of this, you would get a positive return? Now, that is the question I want you to ask. And if you'll ask that question today as I do this lesson, I promise you, you are on the path to getting a return, a positive return on your failure. Now, I've written a lot about failure. I talk a lot about failure. Somebody asked me one time why that was so, and I said it's because I've had a lot of failures in my life. I've had a lot of losses. Several years ago, I wrote a book called Failing Forward. It's a great book. Literally, it's sold over a million copies. And it's a book on how to fail successfully. But let me tell you the story of behind the writing of that book. Margaret and I were getting ready to uh, go to Norway to, to see the fjords of Norway. We we're going to go on a cruise. And a couple of weeks before that cruise, I was looking at my calendar kind of carefully, and I realized that it was a two-week cruise to see the fjords of Norway. And I thought, man, that's a long time to see the fjords of Norway. And wow, I, you know, my gosh. I wish we could, you know, make it shorter. So I sat down with Margaret. We talked about, you know, could we reduce the two-week cruise to a one-week cruise? And we had a good conversation. And, and then a couple of weeks later, we, we took off to do our two-week cruise to see the fjords of Norway. You see, anybody that doesn't believe in compromise hasn't stayed married very long. And Margaret and I have been married for 53 years. Okay. But we made a deal. If we're going to be two weeks looking at the fjords of Norway, I asked her, well, at least, can I write a book? Is that okay? I would love to write a book, and I wanted to write the book Failing Forward. And she said yes. And so we had this beautiful suite right up front of the ship, all glass, so we could see everything. I had a table. I had a legal pad. I had my four-color pen. That's yes, yes. I write my books with by hand on a four-color pen. And so I'm sitting there at my table and I'm writing the book Failing Forward as this ship goes into these inlets to, to show us the fjords of Norway. And every once in a while over the speaker system, there would be a voice and say, now look to your left, there's a fjord here. And I'd stop writing and I'd look over there and sure enough, there, there wow, yeah, there was a fjord. I'd look at it for a moment. I'd say, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Just amazing. Wow. Incredible. And then I'd go back to writing my book. A little later, maybe we'd go over and pull up to another fjord, and this fjord would be on the right side of the ship, and I'd stop writing, and I'd look at that fjord. I'd say, boy, Margaret, look at that fjord. And, and then, you know, I'd look at that fjord, fjord kind of closely, and and then I'd look back at the other fjord that I had just previously seen. Wow. You, you know, honey, that fjord looks just like that fjord. <laughs> and I'm writing my book. Two-week cruise is over. I've written Failing Forward. It's on 220 legal pages held together with a rubber band. And Margaret is walking off of the ship and uh, book is now written. And, and we're about halfway off the ship and she stops and she turns around and said, John, she said, I just want you, I just want you to know, I really love the book. And I said, well, thank you, honey. Thank you very much. I said, what, what did you like so much about it? Oh, she, she said, you were so open and honest about your failures and almost every page you you know you just say well I I did that and it didn't work out and I I tried that and wow it, that was a mess up she said the reader is going to love this book because every page you're just very honest authentic you just talk about your failures she said they're just going to they're going to feel so close to you. I said, well, thank you very much. And then she said, but there's only one problem with the book. I said, well, hey, what, what could that be? 
And she smiled real big. She said, you didn't put all your failures in the book. <laughs> you didn't get them all in. And, and then she started laughing. And she said, I see a series coming on. Failure 101, 201, 301. And, oh, we laughed about that that day and continually since that time. And she was right. I had more failure books to write. A few years later, I wrote a book called Sometimes You Win, Sometimes You Learn. It's all about the fact that the question is not, did you fail? The question is, did you learn from the failure? And now I'm teaching on how to receive a return on failure, which this will be a, a future book, no doubt, also. So what I'm wanting you to know as we start this simple lesson on how to receive a, a, a return on failure, I, I've talked a lot about failure, and I think I understand it. And my goal is this. At the end of this lesson, this teaching, I'm hoping that you will embrace failure more than you're embarrassed by it. So many people, they get embarrassed by their failure. I want you to embrace it. So how do you and I receive a return on failure? Number one, keep failure and success together. This is very important. I have had uh, for 40 years what I call learning lunches. Now, a learning lunch is where I sit down with somebody, I take them to lunch, I buy their lunch. And um, this person I take out, they're better than me, bigger than me, faster than me, smarter than me, more successful than me. And I'm having the lunch to learn from them. I, I want them to teach me. So we go to a nice restaurant and I buy their lunch. I don't even eat lunch. I I just literally uh, take notes and ask questions. And I ask seven questions, and um, I just find that the questions I ask do be very helpful in helping me to grow and learn and improve my life because of the person that I'm having lunch with. So one of the questions I ask that just is so helpful is I look at them and I ask, talk to me about what's the most important lesson that you've ever learned in your life? And they began to talk to me about some very important lesson they learned in life. And now that I've had hundreds of these lunches with hundreds of different people, I have come to a startling conclusion. Every time I ask a person, what's the most important lesson you've ever learned in your life? They always tell me about something they've learned that includes a failure in their life. There was a loss. I don't know. Maybe there was a, the death of a loved one, or, or perhaps it was the breakup of a marriage. Maybe, uh, hey, maybe they went bankrupt in their business. But, but they always talk about a, a loss, a problem, a miss, a failure, a mistake. And every time when I say, what's the most important lesson you ever learned in your life? They talk about some failure that they've had and how they learned from that failure and how they overcame that failure. Now, this is huge. So as I review all the questions I've asked about important lessons, and here are the answers which include some kind of a loss, some kind of a failure, I have come to the conclusion, if you want to return on your failure, you need to keep failure and success right together. They belong together. But what do we do? We separate them. We, we put success over here, and we put failure away over here, and we tell people, now, now really uh, succeed, be successful. And, oh, oh, don't fail, don't fail, don't fail. Okay, do it right, do it right. And, and we, we separate success and failure, and that's not the way life is. Nobody has ever looked at you in their life and said, for several years, all I did was succeed, and then were, for a few years, all I did was ever fail. They, they, no one lives a life where success and failure are separated, and yet that's exactly what we're taught to do. I'm saying forget it, put them back together, keep success and failure together. They belong together. They need each other. Let me explain. You know, Bill Gates is the one who said success is a lousy teacher. It causes people to think they can't lose. 
What he was basically saying is, you show me success without failure, and I'll, I'll show you a person that's in trouble. So, we need to keep success and failure together because let's say, for example, I'm just on a success roll, and I'm just hitting the ball and doing really good, and I'm succeeding, succeeding, succeeding. I need to keep failure close to me. I need to remember what failure looks like. I need to embrace failure when it happens during my role of success. I need to keep failure close to me because in my success, if I remember my failures, it teaches me humility. And humility is the number one quality needed in a leader's life because humility makes me teachable, makes you teachable. When we're humble, we don't think we have all the answers. There's a a lack of arrogance in our life and this kind of been there, done that mindset that's not healthy at all. So in my success, I need to keep failure close because it teaches me humility. And when I'm failing a lot, it's just not, you know, I'm in the ditch. I'm not having a lot of good days right now. When I'm failing, I need to keep success close to my failures Because when I remember my successes, it gives me resiliency. And resilience allows me to pick myself up and get out of that ditch and get back on the road and do it again. So I encourage you, you got to keep them together. If you want to return on your failure, keep success and failure together. That's number one. Number two, If you want to get a return on your failure, number two, understand the difference between good misses and bad misses, because there is a difference. And I don't want you to miss this. Um, Again, I'm just writing this as I teach it, and so I'm still learning myself and growing myself, but here's what I know. There's such a thing as a good miss, and there's such a thing as a bad miss. That's why in my book on failing forward, why did I call it failing forward? What I was doing is I was giving you a picture of a good miss. I, yes, I didn't hit it, but I failed forward. I, I got a little closer to it. Just like a bad miss would be failing backward. Now I'm further from my goal than I ever had imagined. So I have to understand the difference between a good miss and a bad miss, because good misses are good. And it's possible for me to have several good misses until I really get close enough to get that hit and and, and succeed the way that I want to. It's never possible for me to have bad misses and finally succeed. So I've got to know the difference, understand them, embrace the good misses, Get rid of the bad misses. Let me explain to you just what I mean when I say good miss, bad miss. Okay, here's a good miss. I I tried something and, and it didn't work, but I learned from it and so I made adjustments. You see, in good misses, I make adjustments. I make corrections. I, I tweak it. I have a wonderful friend, Tom Watson, who was one of the 10 greatest golfers ever, and we were playing golf one day, and Tom has won, I think, over 50 PGA tournaments. He said, John, there are only five tournaments that I won that on Thursday when the tournament began, goes four days through Sunday. There were only five tournaments that I won that on day one I just thought, I'm going to win. My swing is so smooth, it's so grooved, my game is so at the top of what I should be, I'm going to win. He said, all the rest of my wins, by vast, the majority of them, 90% of them, I had to adjust my swing during the tournament. Something went wrong, and all of a sudden, I wasn't smooth, and I was not miss. I just just wouldn't, and I'd have to go to the practice. I'd have to go to the practice range after I played all day, and I'd have to work on my swing. He said, said, in most of my victories, I adjusted myself to victory. I had to make corrections. I had to make some improvements. I had to tweak myself. You see, a good miss is is when I make adjustments. Now, hang on. And a bad miss is when I make excuses. 
Yeah. That's badness. Wow. When, when I start making excuses for why I haven't, couldn't, shouldn't, didn't, I'm in trouble. And by the way, a real good excuse is a real bad excuse. You, you know that, don't you? That when you have a good excuse by why you haven't done something, it's so good you believe it and you accept it and other people believe it and they accept it. So now you live in a, in a world of excuses instead of adjustments and you make a series of bad misses because you're excusing yourself all the time instead of adjusting yourself. So, so let me see if I can do a decent job uh, teaching you about good misses, bad misses, and, and the whole process. Portia Nelson, Portia Nelson wrote a beautiful piece. I'm going to read it to you. It's going to take me two minutes. Called Autobiography in Five Short Chapters. And I'm convinced that Portia Nelson really understood the difference between a good miss and a bad miss. So let me read it to you. And, and as I read it to you, ask yourself at the end of each little chapter, was that a good miss or was that a bad miss? Here we go. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I, I fall in. I'm lost. I'm helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Now, question, is that a good miss? Or is that a bad miss? Now, let me help you. Let me give you a hint. Whenever you have your first failure, you don't know whether it was a good miss or bad miss immediately because it's going to be your response to the failure that's going to determine if it was a good or if it was a bad miss. So chapter one, we just know that there was a loss, a failure, a miss, but we're not sure whether it was good or bad. So let's go to chapter two. Chapter two, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Was that a good miss or is that a bad miss? Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. And I get out immediately. Good miss. Bad miss. Chapter four. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Good miss, bad miss. Chapter five. I walk down another street. That's a good miss. It's a good miss because a change happened. An adjustment was made. I walk down another street. Elon Musk said the difference in a startup that is successful and one that is not is that the successful startup recognizes mistakes and fixes them quickly, and the unsuccessful one tries to avoid mistakes altogether. So if you want to get a return on your failure, we've learned two things already. We've learned that we're to understand the differences between good misses and bad misses, that we're to keep failure and success together. Let's go to number three. If you want to return on your failure, embrace hard. Embrace hard. There's a book I would encourage you to read. It's a classic book. It's written by psychiatrist Scott Peck. It's called The Road Less Traveled. Literally, when I was young, I read this book, and it had a profound impression upon my life. In the, road, in the book, The Road Less Traveled, Scott Peck opens up the book with this sentence. In fact, the first three words describe the book. Here's what he says. Life is difficult. 
Scott Peck says <clears throat> that this is one of the greatest truths that we can ever learn, that life is difficult. And he says also, if we learn that life is difficult and we embrace it, he said, what we'll discover is we live much more effectively. And in fact, what we discover is once we embrace that life is difficult, it's not as difficult. Why is it not as difficult? Because we now have embraced that this is the way life is. The way I explain it to people all the time is I use this visual. Everything worthwhile is uphill. Everything. All of your dreams, they're uphill. There is no such thing as you having a downhill dream. If you're trying to build a business, it's all uphill. There's never been such a thing as coasting your way to success. There's never been a book written on accidental accomplishment. Everything worthwhile is uphill. It's all uphill. Wow. Embrace hard. That's why we need to be intentional. The only way that you climb uphill is to be intentional in climbing. You Again, you didn't accidentally get there. So to return to receive a return on failure, one of the most important things we can do is just basically say life is hard. And the moment that we embrace hard and know that life is difficult, we expect losses, we expect misses, we expect failures. Of course we do. I do, you do, we all do. When I was in Milan with you, I I, I shared with you that uh, a cute little story. I was I was teaching a leadership conference one day, and uh, a couple thousand people were there, and they paid a lot of money to come, and there was a lot of laughter. It was just a, a great environment. And it's the afternoon break, and I'm signing books, a long line, and I'm meeting people, and this kid comes up to me, all excited. And he said, I love this seminar. I love what's happening. He said, I made a decision. I said, well, what is it? He said, I decided I want to do what you do. I said, I love that. Congratulations. Congratulations. He is just on cloud nine. I looked at him. I said, do you mind if I asked you a question? He said, no, no, not at all. I said, I, I got it. Did you like to do what I do? I got that. The question is, would you like to do what I did so you can do what I do? You see, you see me today with success, but there's been an awful lot of failures and losses and misses and practices. I, I wasn't this good in the beginning. Would, would, you, would you like to do what I did? People, when I talk about communication, they say, John, you're such an incredible communicator. Well, I think I am, but let me ask you a question. How many times do you have to be a great communicator before you're a great communicator? I mean, I didn't become a great communicator the first time I tried this. I've spoken over 13,000 times. Think about it. If I can't communicate effectively after 13,000 times, I'm in deep weeds. I chose the wrong profession. You see, Today, I can communicate with ease, and people love it, but I've done it 13,000 times. You see, I know you want to do what I do, but do you want to did the 13,000 times? That's the question. My books have sold millions and millions and millions of copies, but I didn't even have a bestseller until my 16th book. I had to write 15 books before I got a bestseller. I, I know you'd like to be a bestseller. I got that. I know you want to do what I do, but would you like to do what I did? I wrote an awful lot of words before I became a bestseller. You see, the did is the problem. We all want to do what great people do, but we don't want to did what great people did so that they could do what they do. You see, and if you don't do the did, in America, I tell people all the time, if you don't do the did, you're in deep do-do. That's a fact. So if you want to return on failure, 
You want to keep failure and success together. You want to understand the difference between a good miss and a bad miss. And you want to just embrace hard because life is hard. There's nothing easy about life. Once you accept that, though, life becomes easier. Number four, if you want to be highly successful, you need to anticipate failure. Now, that, that sounds negative. That's kind of a that's kind of a downer. Wow, I mean, John, I what do you mean? I have to anticipate failure. That's kind of a negative way to live your life. No, I don't mean that at all. What I want you to know is if you're going to do anything great, you're going to have a lot of failure. It, it's it comes with the package. So you anticipate failure not with a spirit of dread, you anticipate failure with a spirit of reality. It's just going to happen. And what happens is anticipation influences preparation. And the value of anticipating failure is it gets us ready for potential failures. When I wrote the book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, it became a bestseller immediately. We did a book tour in America. Uh, We had a plane and We literally spoke at three different cities every day for a week. So we did 21 cities in a week talking about the 21 laws. And so we started on the East Coast, and we worked our way clear out to California, the West Coast. We were flying back after that book tour, and we were coming into Atlanta. And as the plane was getting ready to land— we were about 50 feet from above the runway. We, we hit a wind shear. And the plane just dropped immediately to the runway. And when we touched down at the runway, I knew we were in trouble because we didn't touch down straight. We touched down sideways. And I knew that, flip was, that, that plane was going to flip. But what was amazing is the moment we touched down wrong, that pilot put the nose of that plane back up in the air, and we got back up in the air. Wow, so close. And we circled the field a couple of times. We came down, landed safely. <laughs> when I got off the plane, I kissed the ground. And when the pilot got off the plane, I kissed the pilot. And I said, that was amazing. Wow, that was incredible. How, how did you do that? Mm-hmm. How did you get that? plane so quickly. Make How did you make that decision to get that plane up in the air so quickly? And here's what he said. I didn't make that decision quickly. I made that decision 20 years ago. He said, when I decided to become a pilot, I asked myself, what could go wrong when I fly? And I listed all the problems that you could have in a plane. And with every anticipated failure and problem, I put out an answer of how I would handle that situation. What what am I going to do? What am I going to do if the plane hits wrong on the runway? Well, I'm going to get the plane back up in the air because there's a lot more give and take in the air than there is on the, on the ground. Oh, of course there is. Hello? You see, he anticipated the failure, and that in itself allowed him to make that decision. There's something incredible about us anticipating the possibility of losses and misses that allows us to really improve and get better. Let, let me explain it this way. I, I have a passion. It's I, You could call it a bucket list. I would like to see transformation happen in a country, and I'd like to be catalytic in seeing that happen. Now, that isn't going to be easy. It hasn't happened for a couple hundred years, but I believe it can happen. So through our nonprofit organization, Equip and the John Maxwell Leadership Foundation, we go into countries to teach good values in small groups in order to help people learn those good values, live those good values, and become more valuable to themselves and others, and therefore bring transformation to their home, their family, their community, and and who knows, maybe their country. So when I talk to people about my bucket list of, of, of seeing in my lifetime, through the efforts of our players, our team, a country transformed, they look at me and say, wow, that's a huge goal. Uh, 
to, to think it will happen. And I think what I say to them really surprises them. I look at them and say, well, I want it to happen, but I'm not certain it will. And then they kind of sit back and thought, wow, you, you're taking a journey trying to do something that you may not even be able to accomplish. And I tell them, that's okay. That doesn't bother me because I'm trying to accomplish something really big. So what I've done is I do what I call mental preparation for a project that is huge. And the mental preparation consists of me thinking and and, and committing to do three things. First of all, I will keep moving. When I'm in a big project and things aren't going well, the tendency for people to do is to quit. When COVID happened, what had happened, everybody stopped. What's happening? How long will this last? What does this mean to me? The tendency is whenever we're into something, quote, over our heads, we have a tendency to stop. And I say, no, no, I will keep moving. And the reason I will keep moving is there's such a thing as action attraction. And action attraction simply says, if I am taking action, if I am moving on my purpose and my mission in life, it's in my movement that I attract people and resources and opportunities to me. It's not while I'm stopped. Opportunities don't come to a person that's not moving. It, it's action attraction. So it, I've made that. I've made because I anticipate failure in a big project. I've made a choice, a, a conscious choice to keep moving. And I have not only made that conscious choice to keep moving, I made the conscious choice that I will keep adjusting. As I learn what doesn't work, I'm not going to stop. I just adjust myself. I do what Tom Watson does. I adjust my way to victory. I wrote a book a few years ago called Leader Shift. It was a very popular book and very popular, especially during COVID, because it's all about pivoting. How do you pivot? How do you adjust? How do you turn? How do you change? Wow. Those are great questions. So I've made the decision, again, because I anticipate in the projects that are so big that there'll be a great amount of losses and misses and failures. So I've made the mental uh, mental preparation, I will keep moving and I will keep adjusting. And thirdly, I will keep believing. Even when other people, they don't believe in me, that's okay. In fact, let me say that you don't have to believe in me, but you have to believe that I believe in me. And that's the key. To get a return on failure, you just have to overcome a lot. But that's okay, because in the process of overcoming a lot, adjusting, I will keep moving, I'll keep adjusting, I'll keep believing, you you finally, you finally have a breakthrough. To receive a return on failure, number five, encourage others with your failures. Earlier in this teaching, I talked about writing the book, Failing Forward, and my wife, halfway off of the ship, looking and saying, I love the book because you're so candid about your failures. She said, they're going to identify with you. And here's what I have discovered. I have discovered that that is very true. If you want to impress people, talk about your success. But if you want to impact people, talk about your failures. I learned this when I was a very young leader. I was speaking at a conference, and uh, it was a two-day conference, and there were four speakers. Each speaker had a half a day each. I happened to be the last speaker on the second day. And the first speaker got up, and he did a great job, but really all he talked about was all the things he had done successfully, and so everybody was kind of encouraged by his success, and, you know, we gave him a good hand. And that afternoon, the the second guy in his business, he talked about all his success too. And wow, I thought, hmm, we've had an awful lot of success today. Surely those guys have had some losses and some misses, but they never talked about it. Well, the next morning, the third guy got up and honestly, he did the same thing. He just talked about all the good stuff he had done him. By this time, I couldn't even handle the conference. I mean, I'm discouraged because these guys were so good. I thought, I'm never going to be able to reach them. I'm never going to be able to get there. They're just, they're perfect. So I excused myself at lunch, and I went to a side room, and I got my legal pad and my four-color pen out. 
And I decided to change my le lesson that afternoon. And sure enough, I got up and I looked at everybody and said, I am completely successed out. I can't handle any more success. I mean, I okay, we got success down. But I just want you to know, I'm known for my success, but I would like to talk to you about my failures. I'd like to pull back the curtain, and I would like to show you how hard success is and how long it takes and how many misses I have before I finally get there. And I did a lesson that day called Flops, Failures, and Fumbles. Just all the flops I've made, the failures I've created, the fumbles that I've had. And by the time I finished that lecture, the people were on their feet. They were giving me a standing ovation. They embraced me. They embraced the message. And as a kid, I'm how old have I been? I've been about 28. I looked at this audience of, of, of people, of leaders, and I thought to myself, I greatly encouraged them by being honest, by saying to them, it isn't always easy, and I don't always do it right. And I came off of that stage that day, and I said to myself, I'm always going to talk about my misses and my losses and my failures. I guess that's why I've written books on it. I guess that's why I'm talking about it with you today. Because that's when I learned you impact people when you talk about your failures. You impress them if you talk about your successes. And, and I don't want to create a gap between me and you. You see, if there was such a thing as a genie in a bottle, and, and she came out and she looked at you and she looked at me and said, you can have one wish, what would it be? I, I know what my wish would be. I really do. If, if, if genie appeared to me and said, hey, John, you get one wish, what would it be? I would look at her and I would say, I wish people could see me, not at 75 like I am right now, I wish people could see, have seen me at 25, when I was a young leader, when I didn't have all the answers, when I didn't have a smooth delivery, and when I hadn't written any books yet. I, I, wish you, I wish you could have seen me when I started because I wasn't any good. And I'm not trying to be humble. I have a teaching that is very popular that basically says you're never good the first time. And they love that because it's true. You aren't, we're not good the first time. When somebody says, well, I've never done it before, so I'm really working hard so I can do a great job. I tell them, oh, relax. It's, you're not going to do that good. It's the first time. When you were a little child and you started to walk, you, you weren't good the first time. You took, took two steps and fell down. When you started to talk, you you didn't talk in sentences. You said words that only your grandparents could understand. I, we're, we're never good the first time. And, and what I wish you could see, you, you see me now on the, on the end where I've compounded success in my life. But if you could have seen me on the front end, you could, you, listen, if you could have seen me at 25, every one of you would be greatly encouraged. Trust me. You'd say, oh my gosh, he wasn't very good. Look at him now. That's what I don't want you to miss. It's, it's what I teach in the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, the law of process. Leaders develop daily, not in a day. It's just important for you to realize. It takes time. To get a return on failure, the last thing, number six, it, it's very simple. Understand that the right response to failure will give you your greatest benefits. When, when, when I respond to failure correctly, that's when the return begins to be huge. And here's why. A right response to failure will bring humility in my life, which me, keeps me teachable. And it will give me character, which will make me strong, give a great core on the inside of my life. I don't want you to miss this. This is such an important part of the lesson. So just... Give me a, another minute and we'll be done. I was in one of my companies uh, having an executive circle call one day. An executive circle call is basically I, I talked to a CEO on the phone. This was before Zoom days. And, uh, and other executives joined the call with me. And for 20 minutes, the executive that's the, the you know, it, the, this, the speaker, gives us best practices, the things that they're doing well in the company. 
And then I break those best practices down and apply it to the other executives and, and do a little leadership teaching. And then I ask maybe a couple of questions. And then I open the lines so all these executives can ask the keynote speaker some questions. So this was a very successful CEO. And uh, he had been very open and honest about the fact that he had built a, a great company, but that in the meantime, he had he'd made a lot of mistakes and had a lot of misses, like everyone. And so it was a wonderful talk. And when it was over, I gave some leadership application. And then I asked him, I said, as you look back at all the losses and the misses that you had in your life, which ones would you want to go back and do over? I mean, okay, let's say I said, okay, you have the power. Go back and you can fix that bad decision. You can, you can change that, that behavior right there. I said, which ones would you go back and do over? And his answer surprised me greatly. He said, John, I wouldn't go back and do over any of my failures and losses. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, not at all. I said, you have to talk to me for a moment. And this is what he said. I've had a lot of mistakes, had a lot of failures. I had a lot of things that I could do over, but I choose not to for this reason. The failures that I've had, the losses that I've incurred, they taught me so much. I have learned my most important lessons from the losses and failures of my life. And today, what I know, the wisdom that I have, the character that I have within me, those losses, John, those mistakes, those failures have given me a character and a wisdom that if I wouldn't have made the mistakes and had the failures, I wouldn't have today. So I don't want to do any of them over because the lessons I learned and the character that I developed and the humility that I have are more important than going back and doing them over. If I would do them over, I would lose the lessons and I don't want to lose them. Well, that day I hung up the phone with the other executives in the circle and we looked at each other and we knew one thing. We knew that that CEO knew how to get a return on failure. It was his response to failure that gave him his highest return. In this lesson, I've given you six ways to get a return on your failure. But don't forget the last one. It will make you the person you really should and want to become. Talk to me about your journey and, and how that brought you to become a scholar of failure. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, man. You're a scholar <laughs> right. on failure. Right. But uh, let's right. talk a little bit about what led to your great insight on failure. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up believing that failure is not an option until I started meeting successful people and realized, well, they've all failed. So uh, apparently it, it's an option. And uh, my wife and I, uh, we were, uh, we got to go on a couple of different TV shows because she told a friend that she thought it would be cool to get engaged and married on the same day. I had no idea what that meant. So I guessed and began planning a wedding behind her back over the course of two years. And so June 7, 2013, I get down on one knee. I say, Amanda, will you marry me? She says, yes. I said, just kidding. Will you marry me today? Open up a lounge room door, about 85 of our family and friends standing in there with a the sign that says, today, we were engaged for a good 11 hours, uh, made a documentary about it. It went viral. And so we get on a couple of these different TV shows, end up on the Queen Latifah show, and my wife surprises me by getting me connected with Kobe Bryant. And I absolutely lost my mind. And, and I played ball in college. And, and so huge NBA fan, huge Lakers, Kobe fan. And so I get an opportunity three months from the recording of the Queen Latifah show to, to meet Kobe Bryant. And so I'm like, man, if I'm getting ready to meet Kobe, I need to be getting ready to get in the league. And so there was this, you know, well, Ryan, you're 6'3", you play ball in college, but there are levels to this thing. And so can you really, you know, make an NBA squad? Can you make a G League squad? And so for me, I just thought, man, you know what? I, I probably can't. So why don't I just hang that up and just go meet Kobe and be, be a normal person? But then I thought, man, here we are doing the thing that leaders do all the time, which is talk themselves out of their best ideas. And this was the day I said, you know what? why don't I talk myself into being brave today? 
And so that day I started a, a second documentary called Chasing Failure, where I said, man, what if I get in the ring with failure? Let it give me its best shot. I'll give it my best shot. And let's just see what happens. And so I reached out to about five NBA teams and just said, hey, would you let a complete stranger <laughs> work out for your basketball team? I'll probably fail, but what if I don't? There's only one way for us to find out, and that's for you to let me try. I'm 6'3", 200 pounds, and looking for failure. Sincerely, Ryan Lee. It's like, <laughs> what do we have to lose? You know, it's like, we just think, like, you can't do that, and there's all of these rules and expectations that are put on us that I just love to stop every now and then and go, who's, who, who's making the rules of your life? Who's making the rules of your leadership? How 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 who's governing this? It, sometimes it feels like we've got this middle school principal that's following us around, telling us what we can and can't do. But they're they're really self imposed rules. And so I said, if they put their emails on the internet, they must want to get emails from somebody. So why not me? And the, the first four teams said no. The fifth team said, yeah, we'll give you a shot. And that was the Phoenix Suns. And so I go to Phoenix and I try out for an NBA team. It was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. And I failed at a very, very high level. But what I realized when I got there was, wait a second, how in the world did I get here? There's so many rooms that I could be in at this point. But as I'm failing this tryout, I realized that chasing failure took me further than chasing success ever did because chasing failure led me to an NBA practice court. And I had been in a lot of rooms up to that point in my life but never an NBA practice court. And so that just emboldened me to try things. And so now you talk eight years later, that trial was about eight years ago. Dude, we're just constantly trying things. You and I, before this podcast, we're going, we don't know what we're doing on X, but guess what? We're going to give it our best shot. That's exactly right. We're going to research. We're How, how are we going to to, to grow our, our coaches. How are we going to go from 48,000 coaches to 75,000 coaches? It's like, uh, we don't actually know the answer to that question. But guess what we are committed to doing? Figuring it out. And most leaders are afraid to try things. Yeah. And so I think you can really stand out amongst the crowd when you're just say, hey, I'm willing to fail. I'm willing to take those lessons. I'm willing to go get those lessons first so you can come after me second and learn from my mistakes. I'm willing to do that. But when you're the first one to do it, you you get something that the, the second doesn't, which That's is right. great. And so I think the more and more that I work with successful people all around the world, what they will tell you that they will never post is, I promise you, they all use the same phrase. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I I don't know how we're going to do that. I don't know how we're going to take this company public. I don't know. Like, that's the secret sauce. I'm going, I know, me neither. Welcome to the club. <laughs> and so there is this pressure that I think leaders feel like I have to have all the answers, but you know, the best leaders in the world don't have the answers. And so, so I just, I have this, what I would call a spirit of chasing failure and have been on this journey for a long time of going, hey, let's learn as much as we possibly can from failure so that we can indeed succeed. But if we're afraid to fail, if we're waiting for things to be perfect, we will never move forward in our leadership. You know what's interesting? So one, podcast audience, viewers, by the way, if you're not viewing, you need to jump on because Ryan's a good looking dude right here. You're, you're missing it if you're just listening and not jumping on YouTube. But Ryan, you, you said something right there that I don't want any of our podcast family to miss. You said when you are the first to try something, you get something that the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth don't get, and that is you get grit. And yep. that statement right there, cut the podcast off and go do <laughs> what you've been thinking about doing, but you're waiting for somebody else to try it because you want the Absolutely. grit because the grit will cause you to go farther, further, and yep. longer than the next guy, the next guy, the next gal, the next gal. So let's go, uh, those of you yep. that are thinking about doing something, hey, you talk about this chasing failure concept and, and you yeah. illustrate it on the journey of personal success so well. One thing mm -hmm. that uh, we say on this podcast often, John's talked a little bit about it, is business leaders, leaders look at failure the same way they look at finances. They want a yeah. return on failure. Yeah. 
We want to return mm-hmm. on investment. We want to return on our time. Yeah. We teach and have taught on this podcast that business leaders also get a return on failure. Talk to me about how failure is the source of leadership strength. You know, I I think that there is something powerful about a mindset uh, that is okay with failure. I often say the most important conversation you're going to have all week is the conversation that you have with yourself. And what you tell yourself is so vitally important for for your growth. And so some people can sort of uh, wallow in their failures. They can start telling themselves a very negative story about what they've done. But I think it's important that a person understands that failure is an event. It's not an identity. Some people want to wear their failures instead of just experiencing their failures. It's not who you are. It's something that happened. It's not a somebody. And sometimes we make that trip of going, man, I'm a failure. No, you failed. There is a massive difference. And so I think for a leader, whenever they drop a ball, they have to immediately have the correct conversation with themselves because they could say, man, I've made so many mistakes. I've destroyed it all. Well, did you destroy it? Or do you have the mindset of I'm rebuilding? I'm rebuilding it all. I'm already making my comeback. I'm going to make sure that I took great notes on the mistakes that I made. I'm not saying you didn't make any mistakes. I'm just saying you need new language for your leadership. You need new language for how you're going to start talking to yourself if you're going to be the kind of person that moves forward. The the best thing that I've learned from John Maxwell is simply perspective. His perspective on leadership and situations and people. What impresses me the most about John is the amount of people that other people have deemed failures. He's looked at and said, "Mm, I see potential. So I'm going to invest in that person. I'm going to show up for that person and let's see what we can get out of them. What is that? It's just a mindset. It's all it is. It doesn't change what somebody did. It doesn't change uh, even who someone is, but it does change their mindset of going, I want to be the kind of leader It says, you know what, this is going to be a strength of mine in A, managing my failures, but then managing other people's failures is where it really gets very, very, uh, we talk about exponential impact. When When you're able to look at somebody else's failures and show up for them and give them the right language to have. I think you're you're stepping into a really great leadership space. You know what what I love about you and John is your ability to span different we call them streams of influence or different domains of yeah. influence and and so so I mean you you write, you speak, you you mm-hmm. coach, you consult, you do films, you you make films. And by the yeah. way, if you, I've, I said this earlier, but if you want to see more about what all Ryan's doing, go to ryanleak.com because you will be impacted just by visiting the site. But Ryan, you've done that much like John, John speaker, writer, communicator, con- consultant, coach. He's done all these things and somehow you two have figured out how to you, create a thread of influence, mm. impact, of messaging that connects all of those domains or all of those sphere of influences. Talk to us. We've got podcast listeners that come from all those different yeah. domains. How did you create a thread that connected all that you do? What a great question. I believe something that I learned a couple of years ago, I was at a conference. I was listening to a speaker that I didn't think was very good. I didn't think I could thought it was boring. I could, I didn't just think it wasn't very good. I actually thought it was very bad, if I'm being <laughs> honest. But yet there were people in the lobby that were going, that was the best speaker I've ever heard in my life. And I went, we need to get your ears checked. What is <laughs> happening? Like, how in the world could you think that was? I'm like, you just may not listen to a lot of speakers. I don't know what it is. But, but I realized something that day. Everybody is somebody's cup of tea. Everybody is somebody's cup of tea. And what it allowed me to do was to encourage anybody to say, hey, be yourself. 
everywhere. And you go, you might be afraid to be yourself. You may be tempted to be more like John. You may be tempted to be like the person you read about. You may be tempted to be like somebody you follow on social media. I encourage people to be themselves because what people can sense, regardless of the room that you're in, whether we're talking professional sports, C-suite executives, healthcare, finance, political sphere, you name it. What all of those people have in common is they can smell a phony coming a mile away. And when you can genuinely just be yourself, there is something powerful about that, that people go, I trust this person. People trust John. When he walks through, it's like, John's going to be John. John's not trying to be Tim. He's not trying to be Mark. He's not trying to be Ryan. He's just John. Yep. So for me, it, it, it took me a while to get comfortable in my own skin to be able to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be myself everywhere. It, took, it was a journey, but I think that allowed me to just be authentic everywhere I go. I just did a talk this past week for a good friend of ours, Conway Edwards. This was the first time I was speaking for his organization. And so I'm thinking, all right, man, chasing failure. Here we go. He's like, nah, I, I don't want you to speak on chasing failure. Okay, we can move on to my next book, Leveling Up. And he's <laughs> like, nope. I'm like, well, what about one of my old books, Unoffendable? Like, This is my first time in front of your audience of 12,000 people. And he said, nope, I want you to talk on parenting. <laughs> Con Conway, why, 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 what? Can we can we talk about this? He goes, no, I, I think he'd be excellent at it. And he's Jamaican, right? So he's got a Jamaican ac ac accent. He's going, I think he'd be great at it. I'm like, Conway, can we? Dude, there's so many other things that I have expertise on that I would love to share with this rather large audience. But there's something powerful about talking about your weakness. Yeah. To be able to stand before an audience and go, hey, I'm not here to give you uh, parenting expert advice. I've got an eight-year-old and a four-year-old, which means I'm at about a halfway point of their adolescence <laughs> for yeah. my eight-year-old. So, hey, I'm not here to be the expert, but I'm going to tell you what I'm learning as a parent right now. And you'd be surprised how well a message like that is received where it's not a, hey, I'm this know-it-all and you all need to listen to me. It's more of a, I'm one of you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to raise two men of God that honor the people in their life, that do business the right way, that treat people the right way, that treat women the right way, that operate their finances with integrity. All these are things that I'm consistently navigating versus Hey, let me give you three tips on yeah. how to be a better parent because I'm amazing. So what it does is it allows me as a leader to step into a room to go, let me first ask questions and let me empathize with people in the room to say, hey, I do have a, a vast variety of experiences with global leaders. However, it does not make me a know-it-all. And so I've found that when you ask questions first, it puts people in... Because people can kind of have their armor up with who's this guy? Who does he think he is? But when there's a genuine, hey, I'm, I'm really trying to get to know you. I'm not just rinse and repeat. I'm not just going to do the last talk that I did before. And no, I want to know about your audience. And I want to know what they're struggling with. And I want to know what you're struggling with. And I want to make sure that I'm able to add value to what's happening in this room. And I'm not going to assume this room is just like the last one. So I think that is the thread that is going to be the same everywhere. Like, Ryan's going to be human when he walks in the room, whether it's a boardroom or a locker room, I'm coming in with my full humanity, not my, hey, hi, I'm Ryan and I'm an expert and you all should listen to me. You know what I, what I love about your, and I'm going to stay with Chase and failure. one more question and then I promise you I want to sure. move to leveling up. But yeah. um, one of the things I love about your story is you show chasing failure really could be also chasing opportunity. What you did with Kobe, what you did with your wife, all of us want to sense and seize an opportunity like Ryan Leak. Everyone, yeah. just listen to Ryan. He's going to make you find 
what could be and probably should be and probably will be, to be honest with you, failure, he sees it through a lens of opportunity. But your yeah. message is much deeper than that, Ryan, because also mm-hmm. there is a reoccurring theme in all of your chasing failure that is about resilience. And, I, and before we leave chasing failure, you're, you're brilliant in your resiliency. And I'm telling you, I work with corporations mm-hmm. all around the globe. I work with leaders yeah. right now post-COVID that are dealing with the fact that people are not resilient anymore. So before we leave yeah. chasing failure, how do we turn adversity into a transformational force mm-hmm. by allowing resiliency to drive the leader's day? Uh, I. I think that was very well, well said. Resilience is absolutely required for the future. Mm. There is no version of our future that does not require resilience. There's always going to be a setback. The world is constantly changing. Are you Are you adapting with those changes or simply getting mad that it changed? You can't do both. (laughs) You need energy to do one or the other. And so I've just decided as a leader, I'm moving forward. The good old days are gone. 2019 isn't coming. People love the glory days, the BC days before COVID. Yeah. It's, they're gone. And so At some point, we have to move on. There are economists that are predicting a a global depression in 2030. Um, Election season is is around the corner here in America. All of these things can shake somebody's foundation. But I think the most important piece about resilience isn't just having it but planning it. I've already planned on being resilient in an election year, regardless of how an election goes. Excellent. I've already planned on what my mindset's going to be in the future because I'm not going to be caught off guard by people being mad at each other in an organization. Like some people allow chaos to take them by surprise and they're like, oh my gosh. And so now you're being a reactive leader. So there's a fire. Oh, let's go get the water hose. No, proactive leader. Hey, let's make sure we've got hoses everywhere. Hey, let's make sure that people are fireproof, that people are ready for things to burn. You want to know why? Because that's called life. And that's just how the world works. And so I plan on being resilient because I know there are going to be setbacks. Yes, Uh, They are some people say that another pandemic is coming, which means as a person that does live events that could change things for me. I'm not going to be surprised by that. I'm simply going to be prepared for it. When you're prepared for chaos, you don't have to be scared of chaos. So for us, we're just prepared. We are literally planning resilience for the future. And it's very important as a leader that we continue to be the adult in the room because kids are going to freak out whenever there's chaos. But the leader has to be the adult in the room that says, hey, we're going to be okay. Sometimes we're going to take some hits, but we have to continue to get back up. There will be budget cuts. There will be times where a staff member tells you they're there for life and then they leave the next week. Prepare for it now. Prepare for people to lie. Prepare for people to to steal. These things happen, but I've already made up my mind what kind of leader I'm going to be in the future before it happens. When I wrote the book, Sometimes You Win, Sometimes You Learn, I fell in love with the title. It was one of the books that, you know, immediately I thought, uh, people are going to see this title and they're going to kind of pick it up because there's something very engaging, almost contagious about, oh, sometimes you win, sometimes, oh, not you lose, sometimes sometimes you learn. And I wrote the book to help you learn from your losses. Now, the reason that I can help you learn from your losses is because I've had a lot of losses in my life. I've had a lot of misses in my life. I've had a lot of setbacks in my life. 
In the beginning, I was mad at the failure. I was upset. But in this book, you're going to learn to make failure a friend and not a foe. You're going to learn that that most of our growth and most of our improvement doesn't come from our successes, but it comes from our failures. I've interviewed a lot of people, and I've asked them, what's the most important learning experience you ever had in your life? If you could say, this is the most important thing I've ever learned. And every time I ask them that question, they come back with me always on the fact they'll talk about a loss or a failure in their life and say, you know, it was a dark time in my life and I had to make some changes and I had to pick myself back up. It's so interesting. They equate their successes and the most important lessons they've ever learned in their life, not to their successes but to their failures. And every time I hear that, I say to myself, well, there's a person that sometimes they win, sometimes they learn. I want that for my life. I want that for your life. That's why we do Minute with Maxwell, to kind of come into your life daily, to just give you these these thoughts, these these shots of of quick learning that can just help you kind of get on your way. What if we started seeing failure like we see our time and like we see our money. In other words, when we put money into, we're at the beginning of the year, when we put money into an investment, you know what we're after? A return on investment. When, when we spend time on something, we as leaders, we're always looking, what's the return on my time? What if we looked at failure as if it needed an ROF, a return hmm. on failure? Hmm. If we realize that in every failure, there was this return that we could get. Now, John's now taught publicly in public settings three times this idea of a return on failure. In fact, the last mm-hmm. time he taught it was in San Francisco, and he said, I'm going to write a book on it. So I, I'm not going to go deep into what John did there, but I'm going to tell you something that occurred to me when this idea of a return on failure hit me. What if we all realized that failure was a part of leadership? It's just a part, it's a part mm-hmm. of it. It's a part of life. It's a part of leadership. It's a part of getting better. Now we go into risk. We go into audacious dream, Mm. dreams being chased with this concept. I'm going to fail. It's going to happen. What is going to be my ROF? What is going to be my return on failure? And then I came up with this idea, and John is going to take this and make it better too, I'm quite sure. But what if we looked at failure in four categories? What if we looked at it first as to get a return on failure, fail first? Now, I mm. wish I could tell my 20-year-old self, hey, Mark, be the first one to fail. I would. Right. I wanted to be the first one to not fail. Everybody else around me Same. failed. Let me learn from them. I don't want to fail. What if we said, hey, I want to fail first because I know that failure is the way to success. So therefore, the quicker I fail at something that's bigger than me, the quicker I can accomplish something that's bigger than me. Let's mm. fail first. What if mm. number two, we tried to fail fast? Hey, I'm going to get this failure mm-hmm. thing, and I'm going to get to it. So many times we're in the middle of failing, and rather than admit we're failing, we try to cover it up and prolong the failure. What if we just went, boom, right. I'm failing, and we <laughs> fail fast, admit it fast, and can get on with the lesson rather than prolonging yes. the failure and living in the failure. Just fail fast. Mm-hmm. Thirdly, why don't we fail frequently? So many times mm-hmm. I felt like, oh, I'm going to fail once in my life. It better be a doozy. Or that's the last time I'm going to fail. And we make, these, we make these decisions as if a leader only fails once and then he grows up. She is right. now wise and she failed and it will never happen again. Well, it's not worked like that for me. If it has for you listening and watching today, kudos. Good so on I think we need to realize yeah. along mm-hmm. the path of leadership, failure is going to happen, but it's going to happen frequently if we're trying big enough things. And then the mm-hmm. final thing, this comes straight from John, is fail forward. Never fall backward. Never fail in retreat, but fail always with anticipation that there's something big around the corner. So, yeah, to answer mm-hmm. your question, I wish my 52-year young self, yes, I said young, <laughs> could tell my 22-year-old self, because I thought I knew everything as a 22-year-old, that, hey, it's okay, you're going to fail, just get a return on it, I think life would have been a lot better. 
I agree. I agree. And why, why did, where do we get that from? I don't know if it, we just perceived it. And I don't know if there are so many of you who are driving to work or going to an appointment right now, or just listening in the privacy of your home and, and you're listening to this. But I know when John said, you know, he had his audience that he was speaking to at the time, say it to each other. But I, w- I want you to say it to yourself in the, in the car or wherever you're listening right now. And I want you to s- take a moment just right now and say it out loud. I'm going to make mistakes. Just do me a favor and say that right now. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. Oh. And, and I think there are so many people, I know that it's been me and I've been a leader long enough of others. And I know you have as well, Mark long enough to know that there are some people who are really frozen, fearful of making a mistake for some reason, either of what that meant when they were a kid in their home, either because something that that happened to them in school or in a job or somewhere where it didn't, where maybe even wasn't how they felt is maybe their job or their parent or their teacher or a coach someone made them feel foolish or dumb or terrible or a failure even because they failed. And so because of that time, because of the mistake that they made, and it might have even been a doozy, my friend, you might be listening today and you made a doozy of a mistake. And for some reason, you can't get past that to make future mistakes like, oh, Mark and Tracy and John, you don't know the mistake I made. You don't know this mistake. And and there is no clarifying mistake that's like, well, if you make this mistake, you can't move forward. No, the, the four rules Mark just kind of gave us, the four kind of failing failing forward steps, fail first, fail fast, fail frequently, fail forward that Mark just gave us, that's for anyone, no matter what kind of doozies you've made in the past, we can always fail forward. But Mark, was there a time in your life, um, because I think all of us in our past could go back to a place in our life where, where we had a failure that either embarrassed us, shamed us, made us feel really bad or dumb. Um, was there a time in your life where you, where it clicked for you? Where was it a mistake that you made that you realized, wow, the fear of that mistake was far worse than the actual consequence of that mistake that helped you move forward? Or was it just kind of a maturing process of several mistakes that you realized you kind of talked yourself through it? Yeah, I, I love this question, Tracy, because... Um... There, there are several mistakes that took the sting out of failure. It really is. I, I think of one, um, I tell the story, I think I've told it on this podcast, I'm sure that I have, of before I started working with John, because of some colossal series of failures and mistakes, um, I found myself counting potato chips. I, my, my poverty line was a bag of potato chips. If I could afford a, po- a bag of potato chips, I could count them out and make those potato chips last an entire week. If I if mm. I did my if I did my math right and if I kept my appetite in check, and that was truly I started with John Maxwell's organization, truly counting out potato chips to make bags of potato chips last a week. I had nothing, literally nothing, Mm. bankrupt, no money. I wasn't bankrupt. I paid all my bills and all that. I didn't have to declare myself bankrupt, but I I truly was bankrupt relationally, Mm. financially, emotionally. And I've come to realize that money and having money in the account is nice, but it is not essential. In other words, Mm. I take risks now financially. Just recently in the last couple of years, we've We've put every, we've bet everything in a belief that we can make our future bigger, better, brighter. And I'll be honest with you, I signed these documents, I mortgaged how, I did all this stuff, and I didn't even think about it. I'm like, wow, I've, I've lost everything before. I there, there's a rebound in me, and so I never want to mm. lose that and allow acquired possessions to stop me from risking those for the future and the betterment of others around me. And, and so that mm. would be one example. When you go through that, and I was there because of some mistakes. I, I, I did not have to go the, the destitute route. I made mistakes to get there. But one of my takeaways from that is monetary possessions and, and financial gain is nothing but a tool to do greater impact. It is not a controlling mechanism to stop me from risking greater impact in the future. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's I think it's cr- critical to point out here 
crucial to point out here to our listeners. I think they can hear you say that and think, may, maybe they're assuming. I'm, I'm going to make an assumption here. You might be listening and think, oh, Mark Cole can do that. He has the means to make those big steps and mortgage his house or do buy all in and not think about it because there's a big safety net underneath there. But what you're saying is you're ta- you have actually taken away the safety net when you do those things. You aren't leaving a little safety net. You are going all in on something. And these are big deals and big all ins. And you don't just make, wake up one day and you get to go big all in. It starts in the potato chip counting days when you don't have a whole lot and you go all in when there isn't a whole lot to lose, but you're kind of saving your face, saving skin, saving your reputation and what your parents might think or your family might think or your reputation. And, and those little steps that you took back then when you didn't have a lot to lose, but food for the week, um, built your, your security, your confidence to where you can get to that place today. So I think there are probably listeners who might downplay those risks that you take to go all in. And I don't think we can do that fairly without understanding that it's been a whole process to get you there. So I, I'm thinking now, let's say we have, we have people who, let's flip it a little bit. Maybe they're leading people who are frozen with the fear of making mistakes. And if they don't know their people well enough, which it's really important that we know the people that we lead, um, we, they might not understand what is holding them back, those fears that are maybe rooted in childhood and rooted in something in young adulthood that have them you know, gripped with fear from making a mistake in their professional life. So can you talk a little bit to leaders who are leading people who, or maybe a whole group of people in, in their organization who are gripped with fear and who aren't taking necessary steps or risks in their professional lives um, that are necessary in order for the team to move forward? How does a leader move the team forward if they're gripped with fear of mistakes? I, I think that you really got to grasp what John's saying in point number two. Don't make the biggest mistake of all, which is doing nothing. I love what you said. There is there is no safety net when you're going all in. That that defies the whole concept of being all in, pot committed. Right. Over it. there's no safety net. I'm out if right. this doesn't work. I I somebody else has to come and step in because I couldn't make it work. And uh, I think that we've got to get that mindset because oftentimes we risk what we can manage rather than mm. risk what we can't manage. And when we mm. risk what we can't manage, that's all in and that's making a decision. I'm not going to sit here and do nothing. And that, that, I think that's the biggest thing, Tracy, to, to capture in this lesson is what is it? John, John, in the middle of this lesson that he's talking right now, he said he was asked the question a long time ago. What would you try if you knew failure wasn't an option? What a great question. Remember that? You've been asked that question. It's, it's one of those questions. What's oh, yeah. the two greatest days of a person's life? It's one of those rhetorical questions we've heard over and over again. What would you risk if you knew failure wasn't an option? Or what would you try? John said, I've got a better question for us. What would you risk if you knew failure was going to happen, but you would learn from it? Oh, oh. So there's something so big that I can go in and calculate I'm probably not going to make it, but it's going to be okay. That's yeah. the mindset that we're after because I believe, I, I believe back to this quote I used at the very beginning, failure is not the opposite of success. It's part of success. Ariana, that is exactly right. Ariana Huffington had it right. Success and failure are not opposite. They are codependent. For you mm-hmm. to really be successful in your life is going to mean how big you are in your failures. John said it. What was it? Point number seven says, remember that the size of the person, not the size of her mm-hmm. mistakes, determines success or failure. Failure is That's not right. failure if you become better 
in the middle of it. Our failure is not final if you become better in the middle of the experience. That one thing, if I could release all of you from feeling like failure is final and failure is defining of who you are, I believe those are the two greatest sources of fear that stops people from trying something so big that failure is probable. I agree. I agree. Well, I will let you close this out, but I just wanted to give one more encouragement to our friends, whether you're watching or listening. You might be having your, your mind blown a little bit and a little bit of fear is creeping in like, dare I believe this? Dare I trust John enough to take me to this next place? And I just want to encourage you, you know, his last point was allow your mistakes to take you to the next level. Let your attitude about your mistakes, forgive yourself, leave it in the past. It It's in the past. Leave it there. Don't carry it into your future friends. And let this be something that really, um, your attitude, let it, let it determine the altitude of where you go, friends. We're well, for you. So, so many of you, thanks, Tracy. So many of you uh, are listening to this and going, wow, when's John's book on return on failure coming out? I need that. <laughs> and guess what? You're going to have to wait. But I know out of literally thousands of new listeners and viewers every single week, I know that there's new people out there to John's world. And there's a book that he's written on this that I believe will really help you. One is, it's right behind Tracy right there. She's got it all set up for us. But, but it's also this book I'm holding in my hand. Sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. And really, it helps with the attitude, the perspective with which we deal with failure. I've asked our team if, if you would give them a discount, if the team would give you a discount as the podcast family, and they have. And so in the show notes, we're going to include a link to be able to order this book. Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Uh, we're going to give you a 15% discount when you use the keyword uh, podcast. So make sure that you put that in there for the discount that you will receive. I will tell you, I would recommend you buy a half a dozen, a dozen, and resource your team with a perspective, especially those of you that are trying audacious, BHAG things in 2022. Get your team to understand failure is not final, and that's the way to do that. There's two other episodes that I want to uh, encourage you to listen to and point you toward that will help you with the same subject matter. Um, one is Redefining Failure. It's a podcast we did not too long ago. And then the other is Failure is Not Final. Both of those podcast links can be found in the show note. And uh, really, here's what we're trying to explain to you today. Our standout statement is this, fail forward. Make something happen that is so big that when it doesn't work out exactly how you want it to, you're big enough to stand that test. Hey, we have always, over the last few weeks, we've been highlighting listener comments or listener questions, and today is no exception. Your feedback, your passing the podcast along to others is the fuel that gets Tracy and I up on days like today excited to come in here because we see and sense and smell and taste and, and can actually experience impact that's happening. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results.